Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Shaw Prize Lecture by Professor Andrew Wiles. Professor Andrew Wiles is the winner of the Shaw Prize in Mathematical Sciences this year. Today we have an audience of over 1,500. We are very honored that Professor Wiles is going to give us a lecture on solving equations. May I first invite Professor Lawrence J. Lau, Vice Chancellor of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, to give us an introduction of Professor Wiles. Professor Lau, please. Professor Andrew Wiles, on the guests, colleagues, students from inside and outside this university, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to you all, and welcome to this Shaw Prize lecture hosted by the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Here we find ourselves in the Grand Hall named after Sir Run Run Shaw, waiting to be enlightened and inspired by our distinguished speaker, who is a recipient of this year's Shaw Prize in mathematical sciences. The prize is an international award founded in 2002 by the same Sir Run Run Shaw to honor individuals who have achieved significant breakthroughs in academic and scientific research in the areas of astronomy, life sciences and medicine, and mathematical sciences, and whose work has made profound impact on humanity. Our speaker today is the winner of the 2005 Shaw Prize in Mathematical Sciences, so ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming one of the greatest mathematicians of our time, Professor Andrew Wiles. Uh, we'll have more opportunities to applaud a little later. Um, now, mathematicians have always been held in great reverence by the young people of Hong Kong. They are frequently associated with exceptional intelligence and possessing an admir admirable faculty for the appreciation of the purely abstract. Mathematics has also been very much emphasized in the local school system. Our students have consistently performed well in this subject, and our society has produced famous mathematicians. On our campus, too, there is a special institute of mathematical sciences devoted to cutting-edge research in the discipline. We feel deeply privileged and most delighted therefore, to have such a distinguished mathematician as Professor Wiles with us today to share his insights into the subject. Professor Wiles completed his undergraduate studies at Oxford and received his PhD from Cambridge University in 1979. He subsequently joined the faculty of first Harvard University and then Princeton University, becoming Eugene Higgins Professor of Mathematics at Princeton in 1994. In that very same year, at the mere age of 41, he astounded the mathematics community and indeed the entire world by making known his proof of Fermat's last theorem. I'm sure many of you have heard of this famous theorem and the related equation, x to the n plus y to the n is equal to z raised to the power of n. The story goes that more than three centuries ago in 1630, a jurist and an amateur mathematician, Pierre de Fermat, claim in the margin of his copy of a book of the classical Greek mathematician Theophanes that he truly had a wonderful proof, but this margin is too small to contain it. This set generations of mathematicians on to find the wonderful proof. And it was not until 354 years later that the problem was finally solved by Professor Andrew Wiles, who had incidentally begun to work on this problem since the age 10. This I found out last night. In announcing the prize winner for 2005, the, mathematics, math, the Mathematical Sciences Committee of the Shaw Prize Foundation asserted, if uh, it, meaning Fermat's last theorem, remained the most famous unproven conjecture in mathematics for more than three centuries until 1994, when Wiles completed his long and difficult proof, which uses powerful mathematical ideas and insights developed in the 19th and 20th centuries. You must be very keen to know how he did it. I am very keen. So let us proceed immediately to the lecture proper. Professor Wiles will let us in on his journey to this profound discovery. The title of his talk is Solving Equations. Professor Wiles, please.
Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's a great honor and a great pleasure to be here in Hong Kong. The story of FEMA begins thousands of years ago. The ancient Babylonians actually referred to something related to FEMA's last theorem, something like three and a half thousand years ago. This here is a tablet written in cuneiform, and in case this is unfamiliar, the language, let me say what this tablet actually says. So the tablet just shown had the following solutions to the equation x squared plus y squared equals z squared. It has 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared, 65 squared plus 72 squared equals 97 squared, and so on. These solutions were written on the tablet. It didn't look like there was room on the tablet for all these solutions, but you remember the Babylonians wrote in base 60 and it took much less space to write these numbers. It appears that the method was probably not a systematic formula, but rather some kind of trial and error. But no one knows for sure. Well, of course, these are linked to one of the most famous theorems in mathematics which dates back to Pythagoras' time about two and a half thousand years ago, and which also appears in ancient Chinese mathematics from over 2,000 years ago. Pythagoras' theorem, which states that if you have a right angle triangle, side lengths A, B, and C, then you get the formula that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So what the Babylonian solutions gave were examples of right angle triangles where the lengths of the sides were rational integers, 3, 4, and 5, 5, 12, and 13, and so on. The theorem actually works both ways. If the sum of the squares does equal another square, then they are the sides of a right angle triangle. And the ancient Greeks, just as the ancient Chinese, used these properties to uh, give a geometric uh, construction of right angles. Well, Fermat's work started in uh, sometime in the early 17th century. We don't know the precise dates because Fermat, during his lifetime, published only one paper and that anonymously. The requirements for publication in those days were somewhat less stringent than nowadays. As you heard, Fermat was actually a judge in Toulouse and he did the mathematics. Uh, I, we don't know if it was in his spare time, but it must have consumed a lot of time. The only two ways we know about his work were first that he wrote letters to other mathematicians, mostly English mathematicians, setting them challenges which they notoriously failed either to understand or to solve. I felt some kind of national pride in rather belatedly answering one of his problems. The other source of uh, his writings was in the margins of a book of the Greek mathematician Diophantus. So the original copy of Diophantus in which Fermat wrote his comments is lost, but fortunately for us, his son Samuel, on his death in 1670, published a new edition of the book and in that book, he added 
the comments of his father. The book was written in Greek, and the comments were in Latin. Probably can't see very well, but here is the uh, question in Greek, question eight. Actually, it's written in Greek one side, and there's Greek one side and the Latin translation. Oh, no, this is, sorry, it's in Greek. And then the Latin underneath, the observation of Father uh, Fema, Master Fema, Cubum autem in duos cubos, and so on, which translated is, it is impossible, on the other hand, to divide a cube into two cubes, a fourth power into two fourth powers, or likewise, any power higher than the fourth into two like powers. For this, truly, I have a wonderful proof, but this margin is too small to contain it. Well, I don't have a copy of the original here to show you uh, the size of the margin, but uh, he would have been ambitious to have fitted a proof of Fermat into the margins that were available. So here is the equation again. So the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n has no solutions in positive integers if n is greater than or equal to 3. Of course, we cannot date it precisely because we don't have the original copy. It was only found after his death. But it's generally ascribed to about the year 1637 based on what he was studying in his correspondence. These were the solutions for n equals 2, which were written on the Babylonian tablet some 2,000 years earlier. The actual question that Diophantus posed was the problem of writing a given square as the sum of two squares. For example, to write 4 squared as a sum of two squares, he gave the solution 16 over 5 squared plus 12 over 5 squared. And as you observe, Diophantus' answer involves rational numbers, not just integers. In that sense, it's not even a particularly interesting question. But Fermat's observation sparked many changes in the structure of mathematics. Fermat didn't actually become famous for this problem in his lifetime. Of course, no one even as far as we know, knew about this problem during his lifetime. He became famous for something quite different. Let me just tell you what it was. Since more than 2,000 years ago, people have studied perfect numbers. These are numbers like 6, which are the sum of their divisors. So 6 is 1 plus 2 plus 3. 28 is 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 7 plus 14. They are the divisors of 28 and so on. In fact, uh, these go back to the uh, Jewish Bible, the study of these numbers. Special deficient numbers numbers such as 672, the sum of the divisors in this case is actually twice the number. So if you add up the divisors of 672, you get twice 672. And then there's this very strange phenomenon known as amicable numbers. You take the divisors of 284, The divisors of 284 are 1, 2, 4, 71, and 142. You add them up and you get the number 220. On the other hand, you take the divisors of 220, they are 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, 11, and so on. You add them up and you get 284. So we consider the numbers friendly or amicable because the sum of the divisors of 1 
adds up to the other. These numbers, too, occur in the Bible, this pair of numbers. And in Europe, no other example of these numbers were known. Fermat made his name by finding the next pair of amicable numbers, 17,296 and 18,416. And this is what made Fermat famous at the time. Nowadays, it's considered a piece of unnecessary and amusing mathematics. Such is the nature of fame. However, Fermat did many, many other things which have stood the test of time. And I want to mention a couple of other problems. After all, this theorem is known as Fermat's last theorem. There were others. He was an expert in optics. He was an expert, many consider him as one of the great precursors of calculus. He really lay out, laid out the foundations of probability before Pascal. But let me mention two more number theoretic problems. Supposing you take a right angle triangle and you ask which ones exist where the hypotenuse is a prime number. So the length of the hypotenuse is a prime number here, and the other two are integers. Well, after Pythagoras' theorem, that would require that a squared plus b squared equals p squared. Or more generally, he asked the question, which prime numbers can we write as a sum of two squares? p equals a squared plus b squared. A second problem, can the area of a right angle triangle ever be a square? That is, with A, B, and C, integers or rational numbers, can the area be a square? Well, the answers to these questions both of these questions were given by Fermat. It's the second one in equivalent form he had, and we understand that he realized the application to this. And the first one actually occurs in one of the other marginal notes. The answers then to those two questions are P is the longest side, the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle. So P is A squared plus B squared. Well, you write out the possibilities. So you have five, square, five is one squared plus two squared. 13 is two squared plus three squared. And so on. So here I'm writing out the primes, which are sums of two squares. On the right hand side, you see primes that are not the sums of two squares. And Fermat proved that the ones on the left-hand side are characterized by being one bigger than a multiple of four. So five is one bigger than a multiple of four. Thirteen is one bigger than a multiple of four, and so on. Whereas on the right-hand side, the ones that cannot be written as the sum of two squares are one less than a multiple of four. Seven is one less than a multiple of four, and so on. And it turns out, and it's not hard to see, that the answer to whether P is a sum of two squares, or whether the hypotenuse is a sum of two squares, the answers are the same. So solving the equation p squared is a squared plus b squared, or p equals a squared plus b squared is the same. And the answer to the second question is that there are no triangles with square area. This is actually equivalent maybe can be deduced, deduced from the case n equals 4 of Fermat's last theorem. It can be deduced from that as something slightly stronger. So Fermat, we know, had a proof for the case n equals 4. Uh, that also is in another marginal note, and he had this theorem. 
Were there two of his other theorems? What about the original of Fermat's last theorem? Well, after his death, this edition of Diophantus was published by his son, and then the problem lay dormant for about 100 years until Euler took up the question. So the case n equals 3 was not written down by Fermat, but it uses his method, and it's very easy to guess that he might have had a proof to that. Euler reconstructed the proof for n equals 3 and gave the proof for n equals 4 too. And then there was another long gap before Dirichlet, a young 20-year-old in Paris, came up with half the proof for n equals 5. And Legendre, who was then 70, and had thought about the problem, didn't want to be outdone by a youngster, and beat him to the second half. After that, there was another short gap. And then Lame, a physicist, came up with a fiendishly complicated proof for the case n equals 7. All these proofs required the same basic underlying method which had been introduced by Fermat. It was his uh, method he was very proud of and described in some detail. It's the method of infinite descent. You assume that you have a solution in positive integers. He proposes then to show that you can deduce from it a smaller second solution. From the second solution, you deduce a smaller third solution, and so on. But if your solutions are in integers, you can't go on getting smaller and smaller solutions forever, at least not non-zero ones. So they can't, you can't keep continuing getting smaller ones ad infinitum, and hence there could not have been any solution in the first place. This is called the method of infinite descent and was introduced, as I said, by Fermat. Well, after this success by Lamé in 1839, a few years later, he announced before the French Academy that he had a solution to the whole problem. Cauchy then also said he could do it. But very quickly, Liouville pointed out an error in the attempted method. And the error was based on a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding of the principle of unique factorization. So this is a very old arithmetic principle that had been first understood by Euclid, but never actually written down. It was not actually written down formally, not in the, with a proof, until the time of Gauss. So it had been tacitly assumed for nearly 2,000 years before it was written down. So the principle of unique factorization is that we have this notion of prime numbers and that every integer can be written as a product into powers of prime numbers in exactly one way. So for example, 28 is 2 times 2 times 7 is the factorization. 300 is 2 times 2 times 3 times 5 times 5, which we abbreviate 2 squared times 3 times 5 squared. The problem is that this principle fails to hold for other number systems. As an example, if we base arithmetic on numbers where we allow the square root of minus 5, then 1 plus the square root of minus 5 times 1 minus the square root of minus 5 is 2 times 3. And in any reasonable sense, if we had a system of prime numbers, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side would have to be a factorization, but they're different. Fermat himself had actually noticed this problem in another form. He used the language of quadratic forms where you see the same problem. And this had been completely overlooked uh, by Lamé. Actually, unknown to the Lame and the other French mathematicians. Kummer, a German mathematician working at the same time, had already studied 
understood and actually published results which explained what to do about this problem. So he tried to use infinite descent, but instead of just using ordinary integers, he wanted to use the cyclotomic integers. These are numbers which are generated over the integers by a pth root of 1. Now, a pth root of 1 we can write as cos 2 pi over p plus i times sine 2 pi over p. That has the property that its pth power is 1. But if you use an arithmetic based on these integers, so sums of uh, linear combinations of powers of this zeta, this pth root of 1, it turns out that unique factorization does not always hold. In fact, for p greater than 23, it always fails. What Kummer did was to introduce a theory that sometimes bypasses this problem. So he understood what the problem was, and he gave a way of measuring the failure of unique factorization. This problem of failure of unique factorization is the fundamental reason why we fail to solve many of these Diophantine problems. So this work of Kummer ushered in the second phase of work on the problem. So this lasted for 140 years. The principle was the following. Supposing you have the equation x to the p plus y to the p is e to the p, then you can write it as a product of factors on the left-hand side, x plus y times x plus a p through root of 1 times y, what I wrote zeta before, times x plus p through root of 1 squared times y, and so on. And you get a factorization equals z to the p. Now, if you have unique factorization, then something very simple happens. You have a product of factors here, and their product is a pth power. Now, if these factors, x plus y, x plus p through root of 1, y, and so on, if they have no common factor, and their product is a pth power, then each individual one would itself have to be a pth power. That principle only works if you have unique factorization. But if it does work, each of these are pth powers. And what you can do is find a combination of them which equals zero, a combination of three of them, and you get a new solution to Fermat. And then you use the method of descent. What Kummer did was he defined a class number, and the class number for this new kind of arithmetic with p through root of 1 is something that he could calculate. And the class number being equal to 1 is equivalent to unique factorization. What Kummer proved was you didn't need something as strong as unique factorization. Something much weaker would work. He proved that if p does not divide the class number, then you could also solve the problem. So this was a great breakthrough and enabled the proof of the problem, solution of the problem, for all primes less than 100, with the exception of 37, 59, and 67. Well, this was very exciting and seemed as if it would lead to enough understanding to solve the problem. But after 100 years, this method failed to get any further. It seemed to be very hard to decide whether p would divide this class number or not. Even though there's a formula for it, it's too complicated to understand, or too mysterious to understand whether p does or does not divide it. And in fact, it turns out there are cases where p does divide it. Well, when I first encountered this problem as a 10-year-old, I 
assumed, probably with some justification, that the mathematics that Fermat knew at the time, well, I didn't decide this at 10, but by the time I was a teenager, the mathematics that Fermat knew was not much more sophisticated than the mathematics I could understand. So I would try it from that elementary point of view. Later, as a student, I would try using the kind of mathematics that Kummer knew. But unfortunately, after 140 years, it, or 120 years, it had become clear that, in fact, this method could not work. So when I became a graduate student and professional mathematician, I didn't, I tried not to work on this problem because it seemed that there was no available method that would really be productive. That all changed in 1985 when a German mathematician by the name of Gerhard Frey made a suggestion for a completely new approach to this problem. In 1986, his suggestion was crystallized first by a conjecture of Serre and then by a theorem of Rivet, which linked Fermat to a completely different area of mathematics and to a problem in particular that I was very interested in and that, in some sense, mathematics could never bypass. One could imagine mathematics going on for thousands of years without ever solving Fermat's last theorem. But the problem it was related to could not be bypassed. It stood right in the way of the main development of mathematics, and it was one day going to be solved. So let me just say a tiny bit about this, this problem it was related to. Well, the first very simple idea is suppose there were a solution, a to the p plus b to the p equals c to the p, then you consider instead the completely different equation y squared is x, x minus a to the p, x plus b to the p. This is the equation, so now as an equation in x and y. So we fixed a solution a and b of the original Fermat problem, we suppose there is one, and we try to study this equation. This is called an elliptic curve or a cubic curve because it's degree three in x. It's a rather simple equation, but it has one very special property, that if you look at the cubic on the right, x, x minus a to the p, x plus b to the p, its discriminant, that is the product of the difference of the roots squared, will be a to the p, b to the p, c to the p squared. It's a perfect pth power. And Fry realized that if the discriminant of a cubic was a perfect pth power, it would have some very peculiar properties. So his suggestion was to try to prove that such a cubic could not exist with these properties. So one tries to show this doesn't exist. I hope many of you are mathematicians. Um, I know that non-mathematicians here don't like this logic. I've just written something down. How can you prove it doesn't exist? But remember the solution, a to the p plus b to the p equals c to p, is hypothetical. So it's not that this, I'm assuming that existed, and now I try to show that this equation doesn't exist and hence get a contradiction. Well, how is one going to try and show that an equation doesn't exist? Well, we're going to try and show that it has some property that this particular equation can't have. And the property one studies of these equations is a little mysterious, and let me just introduce it. It's to do with solving, finding solutions to this equation modulo different primes. Let me remind you about, if there are any non-mathematicians, well, there are some about mod p arithmetic. So in mod p arithmetic, we just consider remainders. So for example, in mod 7 arithmetic, we consider remainders modulo 7. That is, you divide something and you take the remainder. So the remainders, possible remainders mod 7 are the numbers 0 up to 6. 
so that, for example, if we take 4 plus 4, we would get 1 modulo 7, because the remainder of 8 when you divide by 7 is 1. Similarly, 3 times 4 is 12, and the remainder when you divide by 7 is 5, and so on. And you can consider equations modulo 7. For example, when is x squared equal to 2 modulo 7? When is the remainder 2 after division by 7? And you find that the only solutions are 3 and 4. Now you, you can ask about solving some more sophisticated equations. So you want to count solutions mod p of cubic equations. So this is the kind of equation we're trying to prove doesn't exist. A cubic equation, remember I wrote one up earlier, y squared is x, x minus a to the p, x plus b to the p. The number of solutions of y squared congruent to x cubed minus x mod p is, well, there's a formula, and it's a very subtle formula, was proved by Gauss. It's p if p cannot be written as a sum of two squares, and it's p minus 2a if p can be written as a sum of two squares. Remember, that was one of Fermat's theorems describing when a prime can be a sum of two squares. And this is the formula. Well, you have to decide which is a and which is b. Uh, there is a way of determining that. It's not, I won't trouble you with it, but you can pick an a such that this works. An example, p is 13. So 3 squared plus 2 squared is 13. The number of solutions then is p minus 2a. a is equal to 3. So the number of solutions is 7. And these are the seven different solutions in mod 13 arithmetic to the equation y squared equals x cubed minus x. Well, that was a remarkable formula of Gauss, but there were only a finite number of different examples, really different examples, which have a formula of this structure. So it seemed a very special property of this particular equation, y squared equals x cubed minus x. And so the problem stood until 1954, when Eichler gave a different kind of example. You take the equation y squared plus y equals x cubed minus x squared. If we list here the prime numbers, 2, 3, 5, 7, and so on, and we count the number of solutions in mod p arithmetic, 4, 4, 4, 9, and so on, so you have to work them out. And then in the third column is listed p minus, p minus the number of solutions. I've got them, minus 2, so this is four minus, uh, 2 minus 4, 3 minus 4, and so on. So the third column is just the difference between the first two columns. For example, the mod 3 solutions, the four solutions I've written down here. So finding the number of solutions, it would be enough to find these numbers in the last column. That would tell us the number of solutions in mod p arithmetic. Well, there's a function which arises in the theory of modular forms, which is to take the infinite product q times the product of 1 minus q to the n squared minus 1 times 1 minus q to the 11n squared, take that infinite product and expand it out, and you get a Fourier expansion or a Q expansion, Q minus 2Q squared minus Q cubed and so on. And what Eichler proved was that the minus 2, the coefficient of Q squared here is the same as the minus 2 here. The coefficient of Q cubed minus 1 here is the same as the minus 1 here. The coefficient of Q to the fifth, 1 here is the same as the 1 here and so on. In other words, you could write down one function which comes from a completely different source, from the theory of modular forms, which is an analytic theory, 
And you could use the coefficients of a Fourier expansion to actually determine the numbers of solutions in mod p arithmetic of that equation. Well, this too seemed like a very special example. Until in the late 60s, in fact, in a paper published by Andre Vey in 1967, he asked the question for the interested reader, in fact, was this a general phenomenon? Did this apply to all cubic equations? So already Taniyama and Shimura had, in, had suggested this, uh, Taniyama in a more general form, which was less useful, and Shimura had already apparently suggested this to Vey himself. And then it became a conjecture because this was something people could test was every elliptic curve, every cubic curve, the kind I wrote down, is everyone related to a modular form, that is to a function coming from analysis in this way? Could you count its mod p solutions in this way? Well, this actually seems a very, seemed a very difficult question and is part of a much more general series of problems. But at the moment, it seemed at that time, it seemed to have absolutely no connection with Fermat whatsoever. No one guessed it. But, in fact, it's precisely this problem that, after Fry and Serre, did become related to Fermat. So Fry's idea was that if there's a solution to a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n with n greater than or equal to 3, then you consider the equation y squared is x, x minus a to the n, x plus b to the n. This is the equation whose discriminant is a perfect tenth power. And Fry suggested and Ribbit proved in 1986 that for this hypothetical equation, there could be no possible solution. That is, no possible formula which counts the mod p solutions to this equation. So this is, might seem a very strange link. Uh, there's a way of expressing it in more mathematical terms that might make it a little more, a little less surprising, but actually it's surprising even now to number theorists. It is a, an unexpected link. In fact, I have to tell you a slight anecdote about this, that Fry was not quite the first to think of this idea, um, just so that you don't listen to your elders always. There was a French uh, student named Helogouache who some years earlier had proposed this uh, studying this equation and using it to prove something about Fermat. And he showed it to a great French mathematician by the name of Serre, who just said no, according to Helogouache, said no, that's ridiculous, it would imply Fermat. So Helogouache abandoned it. I don't think at the time there were the right tools to study it properly anyway. Um, Fry arrived at the right time with the right idea, and Serre, in fact, supplied the key conjecture that Ribbit then proved to make the link. So, my contribution was to prove that there is a general formula for counting the solutions, mod p, for equations of this form, y squared is x, x minus u, x plus v, the kind of equation one needed. So there is a formula in the way I described, and as a consequence, Fermat's last theorem is true. So I don't want to go into a, any attempt to explain the proof of Fermat, it's of uh, this theorem about this counting formula, because it requires too much uh, specific knowledge of number theory, automorphic forms, and algebraic geometry. 
but it's something that can be mastered by a graduate student if they devote their time to it. What I want to talk about instead in the last few minutes is one or two other problems to do with solving equations. This is not the end of the story. Of course, it's the end of the Fermat story, unless someone comes up with a elementary proof Fermat might have had. So one can ask the question, about the equation slightly uh, more general than the Fermat equation. For example, x to the p plus y to the p equals cz to the p, where c is a constant. And for certain small values of c, you can prove there are no solutions. The technique is basically the same. Similarly, you can try varying the exponents. It gets a little more difficult. You try x to the p plus y to the p equals z to the r. That's now been proved for r equals 2 and r equals 3, that there are no primitive solutions. Primitive means ones in which x, y, and z have no common factor. Then you can consider x to the p plus y to the q is z to the r. This is where you vary all the exponents. That was actually proposed as a prize problem by a um, Texan, a wealthy Texan, which is now a monetary prize for this one, but I think it's rather a difficult problem. But mathematicians are never content with, with their lot. So the last problem they have posed now is to solve a plus b equals c. Well, that seems rather easy. It's really caught on because the name, it's called the ABC conjecture. And what does it mean? Well, what all these problems have in common is situations where A, B, and C all have many factors. So if A was a pth power, B was a qth power like this, and C was an rth power, all those numbers have many factors. So the conjecture is that if A has many factors and B has many factors, then C does not. So you can make this precise, that you cannot have two numbers adding up to another number where they all have many factors. Unfortunately, the people who pose this problem cannot make it precise enough that you could ever give a counterexample. Perhaps they could do that, but at the moment they can't. So this is what one might call a non-falsifiable conjecture. It doesn't mean it isn't true, it just means it's much harder to assemble numerical evidence for or against it. And I want to tell you, lastly, something else about equations that I've been thinking about recently. And for this, let me just give you very briefly a little more history. It's about equations in one variable first. Of course, the great problem in the Middle Ages in the 13th, 14th, 15th century was how you solve cubic equations just in the real numbers or complex numbers. Um, didn't really have complex numbers, but if there were real solutions, how would you find them? For example, the equation x cubed plus ax equals b, how would you find the roots? Well, there's a formula. Uh, which goes under the name of Cardan's formula. So it's more likely that some of these solutions were not found by him but by Tartaglia. In those days, people, the state of publication was even worse than it was in Fermat's time. You published nothing if you could help it. What you did was you challenged your rival mathematician to a duel in which you'd sell, set each other equations to solve. And you'd have it over a few days and see who solved more equations. And when you were approaching your deathbed, you would summon your favorite student and pass on your 
your methods for solving equations to your student who would then um, carry them for his lifetime. So it wasn't a very effective method of disseminating mathematical information, which perhaps delayed the solution of some of these equations. In any case, the quartic was solved in 1545, and then there was a long gap before the quintic equation was really solved or in real sense not solved. So Arbel showed that in fact the general quintic and higher degree equation has no solution. By solution here I mean a solution in radicals. That is in terms of roots just as we have here like the quadratic formula, the cubic formula. There's a solution in terms of extracting roots. The general quintic cannot be solved in terms of extracting roots. It can actually be solved in a different way using modular functions, but that's not, um, not the kind we're looking for. So general quintic cannot be solved using roots or radicals. Well, some such equations can be solved and some can't. Um, certain equations can be, certain can't. And it was Galois who gave a method for deciding whether an equation could be solved or not. So Galois took a general polynomial, x to the n, plus so on. And in a memoir in 1846, just before he died, his famous duel. Memoir on the conditions of solvability of equations by radicals. To associate a splitting field F generated by the roots of Fx equals zero, so you take a field which is generated by the roots, then Fx is solvable by extracting roots by radicals if and only if the Galois group of F over Q is what's called a solvable Galois group. For example, one can show that an irreducible polynomial of prime degree is solvable if and only if any two roots generate all the other ones. So equations of degree up to four are always solvable by radicals, but equations of degree five or bigger may be, but actually it's rather rare that they are. So most equations of degree five or bigger cannot be solved in terms of extracting roots. I've been interested in equations in two variables. This, equation, this question doesn't seem to have been asked very much. Certainly not answered. For equations in two variables, you can ask the same question. Does a polynomial in two variables have a solution in a solvable extension of the rationals? In, in other words, by allowing extraction of roots again, can you solve an equation in two variables? So in the 19th century, they're asking in one variable, but can you do it in two variables? Well, assume that F defines a smooth irreducible curve, so this is not a big restriction. Then curves are divided into, classified by their genus, and the answer is yes for genus 0, 2, 3, and 4. This is due to someone named Ambrose Pahl, and the proof is quite elementary for for zero, it's completely classical. Uh, you can always do it over a quadratic extension. For genus two and three, you can use the Riemann-Roch theorem to find a function of degree less than or equal to four. That's a map from x to p1. Because it's degree less than or equal to four, you take any rational point in the image, and then because the point on x will be defined over an extension of degree at most four, by the original theorems of the 19th century in one variable, you reduce it to those cases. Genus four can also be solved using a little more knowledge of algebraic geometry. It's the intersection of a canonical quadric and a cubic in P3, and again, you can use these arguments. But for higher genus, it's not known. In fact, for genus greater than or equal to five, the problem is still open. Hal showed that if a, in a different setup, 
There were counterexamples for genus 6, but they don't apply for the rational numbers. They apply for more peculiar fields uh, where the residue fields are not finite and have non-solvable extensions themselves. So it's not really relevant to this problem, it seems. So I wanted to see if there was a counterexample. So the first place to look was, seemed good to look, was the curves of genus 1. So here's an example of a curve of genus 1. This is like the cubic curves we had earlier, but not all of them have a rational point. For example, the curve 3x cubed plus 4y cubed plus 5z cubed is equals 0 has no solutions over the rationals. There's a way of associating something called the Jacobian to it, which always does have a solution over the rationals. And you can classify all the curves of genus 1 with the same Jacobian, the same corresponding elliptic curve of genus 1. Now, this particular curve does have a point over a solvable extension. You can take the cube root of 4 for x and the minus cube root of 3 for y. But it seemed that genus 1 was a good place to try and look for a counterexample because the degrees of maps from a curve of genus 1 to P1 can be arbitrarily large. But in fact, So functions from curve genus 1 to P1, the minimal degree can be arbitrarily large. It's Jacobian, we call E, and then the set of genus 1 curves with that fixed Jacobian can actually be made into a group, and it's a conjecture that this group is finite. So I started working with a student to try and prove, the, find a counterexample to show that, in fact, there were some equations in two variables where you didn't have a solvable root, but after a great deal of work and actually using a method that's very similar to the method used to solve the Fermat problem, we actually found that in fact the opposite is true and we could uh, solve genus one equations. So the theorem is that in fact you can find solvable points. Here there are two technical restrictions which I think are not too hard to remove, um, asking that they have local points and that the Jacobian has what's called semi-stable reduction. So it turns out that for curves of genus 1, there, there are points of solvable extensions, but it's completely unknown for genus 5 or larger, and it would be extremely interesting if someone found some method either for proving that there are such solutions or that such solutions, in some cases, don't exist. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Wiles. Please stay. Thank you. Professor Wiles will now take questions from the audience. Shall I now invite Professor Kaxing Lau, Chairman of the Department of Mathematics of COHK, to conduct this QA session? Professor Lau, please. The Fermat last theorem is actually a 300 year old legend in mathematics, and the final solution adds more color to it. And uh, this is a personal triumph of uh, Professor Wiles. And um, uh, more than that, actually, many people work on this one, and then they actually push number theory into a, to a new high, and then uh, uh, introduce so many new directions. And uh, this is actually a great accomplishment uh, in the last century. Uh, now, uh, let, let me thank Professor Wiles for the very wonderful talk. And also, uh, Professor Weil will answer some of the, your questions. We have uh, three mics. Uh, if you have any questions, could you please go to the mic and then uh, make the questions? Uh, let me ask uh, the first question. Uh, 
During the time uh, you attempted to solve these uh, Fermat's last theorem, there were uh, competitive uh, approaches, uh, like uh, the group using Arakelo theory and uh, groups using Nevalina theories and analog of this. Uh, what convinced you that the approach proposed by Gerhard Frey was the uh, most, uh, probably most fruitful one? Um, I didn't ever set too much store by uh, the other approaches. I think um, perhaps there's some possibility in those directions, but I think those ones would only show that maybe for a sufficiently large N there was no solution, something of that kind. I think um, the methods seem to me to be to have a nice philosophy, but there was no really tangible method to, to make them work. Um, I, there was an announcement at the time that someone had claimed to prove it uh, that way, and I hadn't really investigated these arguments, and actually Faltings, who was an expert in this, was around at the time, and his immediate comment was, if it could be done that way, I would have done it myself. So. <laughs> I didn't have to spend any time worrying about it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, here's the, uh, could you please uh, start the question? Um, Professor Wiles, first of all, does uh, Fermat's last theorem apply to some negative values of A, B, and C? And second of all, um, what stops the theorem from being applied to n equals 1 and n equals 2, which obviously does have solutions? Um, I don't think it applies to negative ones. Um, for n equals 2, um, the, uh, I haven't looked very carefully, actually, but the, um, the critical issue is to work modulo the prime p, which is in the exponent, and the prime 2 is notoriously reluctant to uh, behave as it should. So I, I've forgotten the exact point where it might break down. I confess, I had spent my whole time on, on primes three or bigger, so I, <laughs> I didn't uh, look into it in detail. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, over there is a question. Uh, is um, you've expanded into cubics, and uh, the equation of the form of a cubed plus b cubed plus c cubed equals d cubed. And there are solutions for that. For instance, 3, 4, 5 cubed. Some of those equals 6 cubed. How would that uh, change things? In other words, is there a Fermat's next theorem on uh, three terms in the cubic realm? Um, well, as you say, there are counterexamples um, whenever you have for three cubes, summing to one cube. In fact, it had been a conjecture at some time that you could, people had just, I think it's wishful thinking, but they thought, well, you can't have sum of two cubes as a cube. Maybe you can't have sum of three fourth powers, which is a fourth power, sum of four fifth powers, which is a fifth power, and so on. And the particular case of sum of three fourth powers equaling a fourth power was a conjecture of Euler that it had no solution. And after 200 years, uh, a solution was found. In fact, infinitely many solutions were found by Elkies uh, using sophisticated techniques from elliptic curves. So you, you have to have some insight to make these conjectures. Uh, sometimes the smallest solutions are extremely large. And you could try writing down the equation y squared is x, x minus a to a power, x minus b to the power, x minus c to the power, something like that. But you don't get the same uh, miraculous property about the discriminant. 
in those cases you're talking about. So I don't know how you'd approach it, and no one really has any idea how to find the solutions of an equation of the kind you're saying. I think in that particular case, the methods of faulting seem more plausible for a solution. That is, he's already proved that for curves of uh, genus bigger than one, there are only finitely many solutions. If you could make uh, some bound on the size of the solutions, then you'd have an answer to how to find them. And then if you had equations in more variables, you could also always put, um, well, you look at curves on them, maybe to try and find solutions of those, on those. But I think the, the problems with curves are hard enough. I think problems for surfaces and higher degree equations is really, really impossible. As a follow-up on uh, the curve issue, what was the effect when you go to higher order equations of the derivative? Because essentially you go down one generation, so the first derivative of a third a quad, a cubic is a quadratic, and then on downwards. And obviously the solutions are midway between. So therefore the uh, solution of the derivative is midway between the two solutions for the uh, quadratic. So has, did that have an implication in working with the curves geometrically? Um, I don't think arithmetically you can see the derivative come in in any meaningful way. The geometric approaches to these problems, direct geometry doesn't seem to help that much. Although conjecturally there are links, it seems very hard. For example, the links from Neville-Nenner theory they seem to be guides to what's true, but they don't seem to be any help in proving them. Well, what I'm getting at is that the second, the first derivative of a, bi of a quadratic the, is always in midway between the, twos, the two roots of the quadratic. Right. And but that this, would apply to any other generation upwards. But this is a geometric insight. It doesn't help in finding arithmetic solutions. Uh, there's another question over there. Uh, Professor Vowles, uh, may I ask, uh, when I watched some TV programs and recent books about you, uh, I heard that uh, you are very impressed and amazed by uh, this, um, by the Fermanagh's theorem uh, since your childhood or teenage. Uh, may I know why other uh, famous conjectures about uh, uh, Lemma is not uh, so uh, impressive about, uh, it's not so impressive. Let, let's, um, let's take go back conjecture or 3n plus 1 conjecture as an example. Um, why uh, is <coughs> for the Fermanagh's theorem is uh, much, in, more, it's most, much more impressed, much more impressive? I happen to find this book on Fermat's last theorem. I, I don't remember learning about Goldbach till much, much later. So I got a <laughs> A full book on uh, on number theory. I my personal taste is I think I'm more of an algebraist than an analyst. So I think um, equations are more more my kind, and I tend to be of the kind that multiplies primes rather than adds them. Okay. okay. Uh, we have a question over there. Yeah. Um, you said. You said the uh, Babylonians used the base 60. In the Chinese calendars, we also use base 60. Is there any particular reason you think that uh, both cultures would want to use base 60? Ah, I didn't know that. I'm not an expert, and I suppose they have many factors which makes it many numbers look uh, better. You can write. But that's all right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have a uh, question over there. Professor Wiles, I have a little layman question. Uh, what is the point of view on the modern computer technology? Is it helpful to your, your and other mathematics works and research? Is it useful, useful to you? I haven't used computers um, very much. <laughs> <laughs> I... I think at the time I worked on this, 
I could use email, but I probably... <laughs> I wasn't too good on uh, reading sort of mathematical shorthand on computers, so it didn't help me much. Um, in fact, I was a little resentful when a, the English playwright, Tom Stoppard, commented in the newspaper the day after, saying, oh, because he'd written a play in which some, a girl is trying to solve Fermat's last theorem, and it was on in the theaters at the time. And he was quoted as saying that he didn't like the way computers were used to solve everything nowadays. So I don't know where he got the idea from, but no, I didn't use it at all. I have a student who's found and proved the theorem using a computer, and I find that amazing. <laughs> but, but I haven't done it myself. Sorry, one more question. Uh, something related to the Gorbett conjecture. Uh, will you see that we can see the proof in our lifetime? Sorry, which problem? Gorbett conjecture. Can we, uh, do you think that we can see the proof in our lifetime? As, as you solve the Fermat theorem, will you have target to solve the other one. No, which, which conjecture? I'm go sorry. Back. Sorry, go, go back. back. Go uh, back. I can assure you that I won't solve it, but um, <laughs> there are always, there's always room for surprises in mathematics. The, um, there's currently, as you probably know, quite a lot of excitement um, because people have proved very recently surprising new results about uh, distances between primes. Mm -hmm. And there was some optimism that they could prove that perhaps ultimately that there were infinitely many um, prime gaps of length at most 20, say. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be able to say what number. Um, so that some results like that, it seems, are now conceivable um, by methods that are available. But the experts tell me that that won't actually help towards Goldbach. So I don't know how far off it is. OK, because of timing, this is our last question uh, from there. Okay. Hi, Professor Wiles. So uh, Kara recently claimed a proof of the level one case of the Sarah conjecture. Uh, do you think that the whole Sarah conjecture can be obtained in a few decades? Uh, yes, I doubt Sayer's conjecture would last more than 10 years. How about in uh, 100 years? <laughs> no, no, I, I said I doubt it would last another oh, 10 I years. See. I think it would be solved quite soon. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Wiles. And uh, Mark's last theorem was solved. But uh, on the other hand, there are many, many more mathematics problems around, uh, new and no. Uh, big and small, waiting for us to devote our time and imagination to it. So I think uh, Professor Y actually set up a very good uh, role model for us. And then uh, we are, I also uh, want to thank again for Professor Wiles, uh very wonderful talk today. Yeah, thank you. Professor Wiles, please stay. May I now invite our Vice Chancellor, Professor Lawrence J. Lau, to present a souvenir to Professor Wiles to show our gratitude. Thank you, Professor Lau. Please be seated. Would Professor Wiles please stay? Because <laughs> we have another gift for you. That is um, from the Department of Mathematics of CUHK, and the souvenir would be presented by a group of math students who are lovers of mathematics and admirers of Professor Wiles. And let me now pass the mic to Mr. Yong Po Lam, their representative. Mr. Yong has just completed his MPhil in mathematics at CUHK, and he's now going to study his PhD at Princeton University. Thank you. Professor Viles, 
On behalf of the students of the mathematics department of our uh, university, the Chinese university, we would like to express our gratitude to you today. Uh, the talk has been inspiring, and I believe uh, you've showed us uh, a very beautiful aspect of mathematics today. Uh, we have long admired your perseverance in countering the Fermat's last theorem, to the, well, uh, a theorem which has uh, uh, haunted mathematicians uh, for over 300 years. So uh, we feel privileged to be here with you today, and we've got you a souvenir, a picture of the Chinese University. We hope you like it. Thank you.